uh, Sounds from the Sea. And I'm glad to see so many children in the audience because we hope that this will be a real interactive uh, lecture. Well, we have four presenters this evening who have recorded and made sounds uh, from the world's oceans, and they're going to challenge you to guess what some of these sounds are. We have four speakers, uh, Joe Warren, Doug Nowacek, Michael Moore, who are all from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and Carolyn Levi from the New England Aquarium. And our first speaker this evening is Joe Warren, who is a doctoral student in the uh, Hui MIT joint program in ocean engineering. And he uses sound to detect food in the ocean. So Joe, you're on. Hi, if anybody has any questions during the course of the presentation, feel free to holler them out. And also, if I ask you a question, feel free to holler out an answer, because that'll be good. So the title of this ta talk is about sound in the sea. And when everybody asks, uh, or you think about acoustics in the ocean, there's a certain type of animal that everybody associates with that. And that animal would be? Whales. Right. But I don't study whales. I study things that the whales are more interested in than other whales, and that's zooplankton. Does anybody know what zooplankton is? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. You, that's, I didn't know that until I came to graduate school. <laughs> so these are uh, typical examples of different zooplankton species. Um, this one right here is a copepod, and that's the primary source for um, all, most of the whales in the Cape Cod, Georgia's Bank region. Um, other things that are of interest to us are siphonophores, which are a type of uh, gelatinous animal that floats around the sea, and then euphalsids, which are similar to krill or even you can consider them really small shrimp that you'd uh, get from the store. So the reason we want to study these things is because they're important to all sorts of animals, not just the whales, but also the fishes, and they're the primary food source for the fishes. Now. The thing we do is called active acoustics, which means we put sound into the ocean and then we listen to see what comes back. Now, you've all listened to a radio or a loudspeaker, and the basic principle holds there um, is the same in the ocean for creating sound. What you do is you have a thing, which is the speaker in your radio, which vibrates back and forth. And that causes airwaves, and these airwaves go out and hit your ear, and it vibrates, and your brain figures out that that's a sound. Well, in the ocean, we can't stick a loudspeaker down there because it'd get wet and short circuit and everything would break. So we have these things called transducers. And I think Michael Moore also has some transducers he'll show you. And so we have things like this that we plug into um, tow bodies that we tow through the ocean. And we send out sound waves from here. And they propagate into the water and they bounce off whatever happens to be in the water column. And then we listen and record to what comes back. But we don't just hang these transducers off the ship and go. We make cool little instruments like this. This is an instrument called Biomapper. And each one of these black circles here is a different transducer or speaker that operates at a different frequency. And frequency, um, a simple way of thinking of frequency is pitch. So a low, deep bass sound has a low frequency, whereas a really high, um, squeaky kind of sound has a high frequency. And we send these things out into the water column, and we then listen to what comes back. <coughs> now, a little schematic here of how we do this is we have our ship out there towing our tow fish, and we propagate the sound into the ocean. Now, what things would sound scatter off of in the ocean? Yeah? Um, the ocean water and rocks. Yep, that's exactly right. And ships use things like that. Um, they're called depth sounders. Most sailboats even have a depth sounder so you don't run aground. And all that does is it measures the time it takes for the sound to go from there to there and back. And that's the speed of sound is a constant. And so you can find out how deep the water is. Um, what other things can sound bounce off, bounce off of in the ocean? Fish. Yep, fish. And there's uh, commercial products that you can get if you're going to go fishing. And uh, they basically do the same thing. They measure the energy that bounces off of the fish here, and then they record that. And on a screen, you see a little blob that tells um, how many fish or if you have a lot of fish there. But there's all sorts of other things that will scatter sound. Sand grains, um, air bubbles from the surface, and most importantly, zooplankton. 
And so what we like to do is take our tow instruments and go out off of Georgia's Bank, which is just off of Cape Cod, and we like to measure and find out how many zooplankton and where they are. This is a map of Georgia's Bank, Woods Hole's right there. And this is a cruise track that these instruments go out of, go out on, and they follow this thing around and they're towing the acoustics instruments as well as doing many other kinds of measurements such as taking net samples and uh, salinity and temperature and uh, other types of measurements. And so once we've sent out the sound into the water, we record what we get back and now we have to listen to it and hopefully make some sense of it. Now, a key thing about zooplankton that I forgot to mention is that you don't really find information about one little zooplankton because they're so small. They can be a millimeter to maybe an inch or two inches in size. But zooplankton occur in big clumps that we oftentimes call patches. And so when you have enough of these zooplankton together, they produce a big enough echo that you actually can detect it. And so once you've listened to your sound, you get pictures like this. Now this is the bathymetry or the depth of the ocean floor on Georgia's bank. And these are called curtain plots, um, which follow the track line of the ship. And so the top here, they used to follow the track line of the ship. Good blow bulb. No power's still on. Power still. Should I just switch over to that one? Um, let's see, there might be a second part. Let's try this one. In. Well, this is a good example of what happens when you're out at sea, because oftentimes equipment will break, something will short circuit, and you spend half your time bringing it up on deck, taking it apart, trying to figure out what goes wrong, and then fixing it. So what you're seeing here is oceanography on land in action. <laughs> but eventually it works. Yeah. Is that in focus? Yeah. So as I was saying, you have the track line of the ship here, and this is the top of the water column, and then this is the ocean bottom, these actual bright spots that you see at the bottom of the profile. That's the um, ocean bottom reflecting. And what you can see is out on the edges, or the slope of Georgia's bank here, you tend to have little or no scattering. These dark blue areas mean that there's very little acoustic energy coming back from whatever's in the water column. Whereas on top of the Georgia's Bank, you have bright spots, which means that there's a lot of stuff throughout the water column that's reflecting sound. And physical oceanographers who study how water moves and biological oceanographers who study where animals are and why they're there like, these, like this kind of information because there's really no other way to collect this type of information. Otherwise, you'd have to go out there with a net and take a sample at every one of these spots to try and figure out where the animals are. So acoustics lets you see a broad range of uh, a broad area of coverage. And finally, this is uh, one of my favorite plots. This is off of Georgia's Bank again. And what you see here is just a blow up of a, it's a different cruise from that previous plot. The ocean bottoms here, and then ocean tops here, and you have this really strong scattering layer floating around the middle of the water column. And then all of a sudden it starts going up, and then right there, it all stops. And there's no more scattering in there, or much less scattering. And the scientists that I work with did some calculations and took other data such as temperature and salinity and figured out that there's a front zone here. And a front is um, similar in the ocean to what you have on land that controls the weather patterns. And um, so what you have here is sort of two water masses meeting and the zooplankton like to be on this side for some reason. And they don't like to be on that side. And we're not really sure why that is, but we wouldn't have even known this would occur without the acoustic record. And that's all I've got to talk about, about food in the ocean. Back to the boat, what it looks like the ground, the site where the fish is, 
Um, it can be. It depends on, on a depth sounder that you buy for your boat. The, the bottom is um, usually hard rock or sand or mud, and it gives a very strong echo return compared to a fish, which um, is fairly weak. So if you had a super big fish, then it might show up as the bottom or it might just show up as a little blip. But generally, the echo from the bottom is a lot stronger than any fish would be. But it could happen. Other questions? Yeah. What do zooplankton eat? Smaller zooplankton, phytoplankton, anything smaller than them, basically. Any other questions? We'll have time for questions for all of the speakers at the end, too. Our next speaker this evening is Doug Nowacek, who's also a graduate student in the Huey MIT Joint Program. He's a student in biology, and he works on marine mammal acoustics. Particularly, he's interested in the feeding behavior of dolphins. So he's going to talk about using sound to measure feeding. Thank you, Judy. Great. Well, I'm actually going to talk about a few things um, other than my own work, uh, just because I thought it would be kind of fun, because there are so many interesting sounds that uh, marine mammals make. Um, so first, I won't use the uh, broken overhead. I'll use the other one. Um, but I see they're giving out prizes for right answers to questions. So I figured maybe I'd ask some easy questions that I could answer. <laughs> so anybody, oh no, this one's not working. That one, the big one. Um, so any, any questions that I ask, uh, raise your hands. And, and if you get it right, I, they're still passing out prizes. Is that right? OK. All right. So marine mammals make a lot of different sounds. And, and we'll, talk, oh, we'll talk about a few tonight. Uh, but certainly not all of them. So um, first of all, we'll talk about the sounds that the animals make. Um, and these vary from, I think there's a little write-up in there about clicks and clangs and bangs and all sorts of things, and humpback whale songs and uh, dolphin whistles and um, killer whale sounds and echolocation clicks that they use for, uh, for a lot of purposes. One of, the, one of them is feeding, uh, we think. So that's what I'm looking at. Next, I want to look at quickly at how we as biologists and um, engineers go about recording those sounds, because it's not a, a trivial thing to go out there and record a sound that's being made by an animal that could be all over the ocean or at the very best right along the coastline, but they make sounds that travel in all directions. So who made the sound and where does it come from? In the case of their sonar, it comes right out of their heads and goes straight out in front of them. So it's a really hard thing to record unless you're right in front of them. So, we have a challenge of how we actually record those sounds. Next, I want to talk a little bit about the sounds we make and their effects on the animals, potential effects on the animals. And we have some very specific examples um, of those sounds. The, the things that, uh, that Joe was just talking about, as far as the frequency, it's higher frequency than most of the animals can hear. Um, at 120 kilohertz, they're just some of the smaller whale dolphins and porpoises that can hear it. So, And lastly, so for some questions, we're going to play Name That Tune. So we'll play some so I'll play some sounds. And I want everybody to try and guess and tell me if they can tell me what's, what species is making that sound. And I'll also show some pictures. And we can see if you can guess what species it is just from the picture, not from the sound. So we'll do a little bit of that. Uh, then real quick, I wanted to just mention the species that we'll discuss, just to give you a little hint, since there's many, many species of whales and dolphins. Uh, first, not necessarily in any order, so I'm not giving any hints, or at least I'm not trying to. Um, humpback whales, which we see sometimes off Cape Cod. Uh, more often, you'll see them off Hawaii in the wintertime, whether they're breeding. Uh, they go up into the Arctic to feed in the summertime. The northern right whale, which is a very close to uh, habits, inhabits the area around here very much, and there's not many of them left, so and we'll talk some more about them, and as will Michael Moore. Next is my study animal for my thesis work, a bottlenose dolphin, which is a common dolphin that people see. Uh, you see at SeaWorld or right off the coast. And lastly, killer whales. And killer whales, most, a lot of people don't know that they are found all around the world. It's not just uh, off the coast of Seattle. <laughs> OK. Let's see, can I have the lights down just a little bit, Tim? All right. So here's our first, uh, our first name that tune. And just listen for a while.
If you think you have a guest, raise your hand. We'll, we'll wait for some more guests to come up. more guesses, that must have been a good one. Okay, what do you think it is? Yeah, you? No, it's not a dolphin. That's one off the list. Get a little more so you can get a better idea. What do you think? That's the killer whale, that's right. The that man a prize. So, in fact, that is killer whale, and seen here in the, off the coast of Seattle, which they said is not the only place to see them, but the sounds that you're listening to are made, these were recorded uh, by one of the other students in our lab right off the San Juan Island uh, up there as part of his piece of work. And what's neat about these sounds is that within a pod of killer whales, they all make the same sound. Not the same two or three, but they have quite a repertoire of sounds that they make um, in different, different contexts and different situations, what part of Patrick's work. And you're born into a pod, and you, you're with that pod your whole life. You live in that pod your entire life. Um, so it's interesting that they all make the same sounds in that pod, and there's some overlap between pods. Um, so what Patrick is really interested in is figuring out if there's individual variation within the whales and how they make these sounds. So, the analogy for us would be your voice. So you pick up the phone and somebody's on the phone and you know pretty quickly who it is if you know that person just because of the sound of their voice. Well, Patrick wants to know if um, killer whales can tell each other apart based on the acoustic qualities of those sounds that they make. So, how does Patrick do that? And this is part of what are the technologies we use uh, to record these things. Patrick's come up with a nifty little system. I guess we can see this up. But he has a, um, an array of hydrophones, a long line of hydrophones. And a hydrophone is sort of uh, the opposite of what Joe showed you with a transducer, and that a transducer sends out sound, and a hydrophone just listens. And it's made out of almost the same materials, and a lot of it's the same. It's just a matter of whether you listen to it coming up or if you force it to make sound. So when an animal sound hits that hydrophone, it vibrates and sends um, current up a wire. And we just measure how that varies with time, and that's all the sound is. So Patrick has his uh, boat with um, a big cable coming off of it that's down underwater about uh, 30 feet or so, and then it's got this whole line of sensors, you see those little dots? Those all represent Patrick's little sensors. So here's a killer whale swimming along, makes a sound, and that sound goes and hits that, that array of sensors. And by having many sensors, he can get some idea of where the sound came from just by the fact that it arrived. If his array is like this and the sound's made up there, it's going to hit the front of the stick before it hits the back of the stick. So using that, he can sort of figure out where the sound came from. And that's just a little bit bigger drawing of the spacing has to do with the frequency of sound. Um, and the, he uses weights to keep it underwater because if you, you know, if you pull something behind your boat, it'll ride up at the surface. So it's a pretty elaborate system that he uses to, to do this. So the whole idea is that one animal makes a sound, and you want to know where the sound came from. So you can figure out who made that sound and look at individual um, voice characteristics. So what Patrick does is this is similar to the sounds that you just heard. Uh, 40, 50 seconds of them. And each one of those, let's play a little more. Each one of those little streams would be one of these little blips. And what this is, is just seeing the different frequencies. So the sounds are pretty complex. They have not only low frequency, but it goes higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. So they have all this harmonic structure. Now what Patrick's array does is that zero degrees is straight off the side of his boat. And you can see that this sound came from about minus 40 degrees or 40 degrees back this way, whereas this one came from 20 degrees out in front of him. But if you just look at this, it looks like it could be the same sound. So it's a, um, a clever way of trying to figure out which animal made the sound. OK. So. 
for years, people have been taking pictures of killer whales, and they know the individuals very specifically by the shape of that dorsal fin, what they call a saddle patch, which sits right behind the fin. Um, so there are a lot of characteristics, and they show arrows where there are distinctive features. Um, but Patrick's works is some of the first that is starting to look at individual voice characteristics. And it's an interesting in a system where all the whales make the same sound. So you're trying to figure out something about uh, their voices. OK, next we're going to have a uh, name that face. So the next slide, can anybody tell me? Oh, it's backwards. Can anybody tell me what that is? OK, how about you? Try again. That's the dolphin. That's right. That's a bottlenose dolphin. Um, and you'll notice, just as an aside, not having anything to do with sound, but you see those, those no nicks and notches in that fin. We can focus that a little bit. There. See how there's some nicks and notches and scratches on that fin? Well, we identify bottlenose dolphins the same way we identify, um, they identify killer whales by their fins. So uh, dolphins also make individually specific whistles that uh, have been studied for uh, over 20 years now. And over the first few months of their lives, the, the animals develop their own individual signature whistle that they use then throughout their lives. Um, so that has a lot of interesting implications just in the sounds they make. Question? Well, it's not really a question, but I can make a dolphin sound. Oh, yeah? Go for it. Oh, I've heard that one. <laughs> we have a dolphin in the front row. <laughs> he should get another prize for that, don't you think? OK. OK. So the dolphins make a lot of different sounds, and that does sound very much like one of the sounds they make. So not only do they make these whistles, but they make echolocation clicks, which is the thing that, that I study, uh, the biosonar, and their use when, they, when they're out there foraging. So to get those sonar clicks, which as I said, they produce them straight out in front of themselves, and it's a very hard thing to record. So, oh, there's another picture of a dolphin, not that, with a fish in its mouth. So we have taken to putting, oh, and I didn't even bring it with me. That's terrible. We have these plastic saddle packs, and I'm very sorry they didn't bring it, um, that go right around the dorsal fin, and they have suction cups on the inside. So by doing this, we don't have to drill anything through the fin, which has been done a lot in the past in research. So it's a non-invasive tag, which is really nice um, for everybody, especially the dolphin. And on the other side of this pack, there's a little, um, a little recorder, a little tape recorder that's inside a waterproof housing, which doesn't always stay waterproof, but when it does, uh, we get sounds of the animals as they're traveling through their normal lives, hopefully normal, um, and we get a, a full record of, of every sound they make and also some of the sounds around them. We can go out in boats and just put a hydrophone in the water and listen to the sounds as well, uh, but this way we get, we know that it's that animal that made the sound, which is part of the, part of the problem when you're trying to study these guys is that we don't know exactly who makes which sound. So what I thought I would do is play some sounds from one of our, one of the track packs. Here's a question. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, when I, when I, when I put this thing on the dog, uh -huh. track the dog to get him back to the eco That's a very good question. Also on this package, right in this little, there's a little hole right there, and you can't really, well, maybe it's, well, anyway, there's a radio transmitter in there that has a little antenna that sticks up out of it. And every time the dolphin surfaces, we have a receiver on the boat, and it's, it's constantly sending out beeps, but we can't hear the beeps when the antenna's underwater. So when it breaks the surface, we hear a few beeps, and we can get, we have, a, we have four antennas, one pointing each direction or in four directions, and we get some idea of where the animal is based on where that beep arrived. And then when the thing falls off, which it does, because there are, um, there's some metal on the front that corrodes in seawater. And so when that corrodes, the pack splits apart. And you can see our nice pink Velcro that holds it together. <coughs> it floats to the surface, and that radio antenna comes out of the water, and it beeps away until we find it. So very good question. OK, so now this, this animal, <coughs> Um, that I'm going to play the sound from was just from last summer. 
And there's a uh, program in Sarasota that I've participated in for a few years now, a temporary capture and release. So we go out and we actually catch wild dolphins and um, do some medical sampling on them. And we record their sounds the whole time they're on the boat. Uh, and then we release them after about an hour. Uh, it's been a very successful program and there's never been any animals uh, injured, which is a good thing. So this animal has a package on it and it's just about to be let go. That's water against the hydrophone. What you'll hear is, you'll hear the water flowing over the animal's flukes as it flukes, so you'll start to hear <laughs> surfing. The animal's flukes moving as it moves through the water, which is, there's some whistles. Totally didn't expect to get that. Some more whistles. Um, one of those things we put a package out there, a data recording package, and it yielded something we had no idea that we get. So we can get some idea of all things of swim speed, uh, at least the fluke stroke rate, um, with behavior. So it's it's a neat piece to have as, as well as the acoustic. So you hear a few more whistles in there. Can I bring it up just a little bit, Tim? I think there's a couple more whistles. There they are. So they're very short and uh, they're not making sound all the time if they're out there in the wild, which people uh, think they are. But okay. Moving right along. We have another name that tune. Is everybody ready? We're running out of we're running out of species to play. It's not a cow. It's not a moose. Humpback whale, that's what it is, that's right. Just recorded this past March off of um, Hawaii. So Jasper got it, it's humpback whale. Um, and the sounds that you're listening to um, are made almost invariably by males. They do all their breeding on the Hawaiian, uh, in the Hawaiian waters in the summertime. And it's pretty well understood that this is a breeding, it's a reproductive adver advertisement, that the humpback males go out. And strange that I would show a mother and a calf, but, um, but they sing out there. And we haven't, nobody that I know of has linked it to how successful a male is. Uh, but it's a very interesting progression of sounds in that all the males in the area will produce uh, a very similar song, and it changes gradually year by year, and they retain pieces from the year before, but there are new pieces in the song too, so it's a really interesting system. Question? Um, they, they are the biggest whales, aren't they? Almost. They're almost the biggest. Does anybody know the biggest? Ooh, chance for an extra prize. Over, Over on the, along the side? What is it? Blue whale, that's right. That's right. Um, are we out of prizes? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, and the blue whales can get up to uh, almost 100 feet long, so that's a pretty big whale. Okay, to record the killer whale, or the humpback whale song, sorry, we have um, a variety of systems. It's pretty effective just putting a hydrophone in the water because the singers tend to be alone, so you can go, almost go right up to a singer. Um, you can use a localizing array, which will get you more direction as to where that animal is. Uh, but it's very effective just to put one in the one in the um, water. Okay. Next. Uh, oh, oh, that's I put that in there because a lot of the male singers will will 
stand on their heads, basically, in water and sing. So not all of them, but a lot of them do. They just turn head down in the water. OK, can anybody tell me what that species is? It's not a great picture. Anybody? Back there? Nope, close. Looks a lot like it. Anybody? Yeah. It's a right whale. That's right. It's a northern right whale. Um, and I'll just talk briefly about some of the recent efforts of, to record um, hump, or, uh, northern right whales. And what we're using is this little uh, acoustic tag, which doesn't have a ruler in the picture. That's not good. The tag is about this long. And it has a suction cup on it. And how we attach the suction cup, um, Michael will discuss a lot about the use of a pole to attach things to uh, right whales. This is the little hydrophone here, which then goes through a connector. And inside, there's a, a tape recorder and then a little bit of circuitry to turn the tape recorder on, to turn it off. Um, and we also have a sensor in there that records the pitch and roll and heading of the animal. So as the right whale goes down, we can see that on the, on the, in the data that it pitched down at 20 degrees. And we know when it dove. We know when it rolls to the side. And we're getting better at, with more precision and actually more range of that. Uh, but it's a very interesting thing to correlate with the sounds um, to know what the animal's doing in the water at the same time. So uh, did I put the guts in? Oh, there's the guts. So this is the guts of the recorder. This little, um, little digital recorder is only about um, five inches long, about an inch and a half wide, and it's about a half an inch thick. And it re records two hours of stereo um, acoustic data. OK, so then the tag right here is attached to a pole. And the suction cup, I don't know if it's not attached yet, but the suction cup's on the end of that. And then we end up with suction cup on the whale. And here's the rest of our tag. So we had one stand for five hours, which is quite a long time when you think about the deployment mechanism and all that. And one of the things, one of the primary goals of this work is to find out the acoustic environment of right whales out there, especially as it relates to boat traffic. Um, because a sort of alarming number of right whales are hit by big boats um, in Massachusetts Bay every year. And when I say an alarming number, you only have a, sp a population of probably fewer than 300. And one of them a year gets hit. That's, um, that can be a lot over 30 years. So we're trying to get some idea of how the right whales react to boat noise. So this little recorder can record, like I said, the pitch and roll and also um, the sounds that are associated with it. OK. So lastly, I said I'd talk some more about um, sounds that we make and how it affects the animals, uh, like the boat noise for the, for the right whales. Um, as part of that humpback whale tape that I played a little bit earlier, later on, there are some sounds made by a Navy vessel that uses those, the sounds that it produces, a lot like Joe was talking about. It's a transducer. It's a big transducer, though, because it produces low frequency. And the Navy uses it to look for submarines and other things. Who knows? Um, but the long and short of it is that they're very loud sounds, and they're right in the hearing range of some of the big whales, humpback whales, um, gray whales, finback whales, and blue whales, and also some of the deep diving pinnipeds like e elephant seals and, uh, and others. So this March, the, um, a group from, from here and also from um, Cornell went out, and the Navy made their boat available, which was very, uh, very good of the Navy to do that, and their source, so we could test the effects on, um, potentially test the effects on humpback whales. So the idea was that they would turn the source on while a humpback was singing, and we could get some idea of what effect it had on the whale. Did it stop singing? Did it take off and swim away fast? Did it, whatever it did in response to that, to that source. So the jury's still out, um, but I thought I'd play for you some of the source sounds at the same time that there's a humpback singing. So what you need to keep in mind is that the Navy probably listened to humpbacks when they were designing these sounds, um, because the humpbacks may have, well, the animals definitely have figured out something about how their sound travels through water and what it can do for them. So let me just play this real quick. And you have to listen to this. It's very subtle. That's
So the humpback kept singing, and as it did in many cases, sometimes they did stop, and sometimes um, Peter Tyak, my advisor, and who did, was coordinating a lot of this work, believes that the humpback started singing louder just to sing over the source. <laughs> so, but as I said, the jury's still out on really conclusive on, on what the effects were. So the last thing I'll play, and then I promise I'll stop, is from, again, from the uh, track packs we put out on the dolphins. This is what it sounds like for a boat to go by a swimming dolphin. And this was another thing that I, I figured we'd get in the, in the acoustic record, but I wasn't sure what it would sound like. He didn't get hit by it. That's when the dolphin surfaces, the hydrophone comes out of the water and splashes and it goes like that. Um, but it's interesting to get a taste of what, a listen, actually, for what, what's going on out there. So. Um, so I'll take some questions. And uh, any questions you have, and um, thank you very much. How do they find fish? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, maybe planted. <laughs> no. The um, dolphins spend a lot of times on the edges of, well, the dolphins that I watch in Sarasota spend a lot of time in shallow water near um, seagrass beds. And seagrass beds are um, sort of a nursery for young fish, uh, at least in that environment in Florida. And probably larger fish around at the same time. And they also spend a lot of times in those grass beds. Whether they look for a school or not, um, we did, I don't know. Certainly, big whales, like right whales and things, look for big schools of krill. But the dolphins, in, in my work, are pretty much chasing single items. Uh, there are dolphins out in the ocean, uh, other dolphins, that find big schools of fish and swim through and catch fish as they go through. So, <coughs> Okie dokie. Our next speaker is Michael Moore. He studies uh, use of sound to study fat uh, reserves in <laughs> green animals. Thank you, Judy. And Michael is a research specialist here at <coughs> the biology department of the Graphic Institution, and he's a graduate of the joint program in biology. And they haven't got rid of me yet. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, uh, the sort of sequence that we planned here is that. Um, you heard Joe talk about food, and Doug talk about how the animals move around and make sound and find things and maybe use various sounds for finding food. And I'm going to show you what the, um, if this thing turns on for me, what the, uh, we'll look at something else first while that warms up. What the whales can do in the way of getting fatter, because fatness in whales is, was very important for whalers when they wanted to make money out of killing whales, but it's also important for whales when they want to make more whales, because if they're not fat, they don't get pregnant. If you don't get pregnant, you don't have more baby whales. And as you heard with the right whale, we're very concerned about the, um, the lack of, um, the lack of babies. Uh, they get hit by ships, but they also get, um, don't get pregnant as much as they should. Why don't we have the slides first while well, that warms up? Hopefully it's going to. And I'll show you um, <coughs> a few things about the whales and how we do it. Okay. What we've got here is another picture of a right whale. Oh, I'm supposed to ask you what it is. Anybody know what these things are? Yeah, in the back there. Bacteria. Any any advances on bacteria? Yeah, in the way back over there. Barnacles? No. Some? Well, that's a very interesting question. There might this is that's a very important question. There might be barnacles in this whale. I'm not sure. But what we're really looking at here is not that. Anybody else? Yeah. Colossities. Yeah, I'll take that as a positive. Yes. Prize. Um, 
These callosities are rather like horns on the hooves of cows and horses, but living on top of these callosities, and for extra credit, what lives in a callosity? Little critters, little crustaceans, called whale lice. And all of these, these orange things here is just a mass, a teeming mass of these things. And if you go up to a dead whale that's fairly freshly dead, they climb onto your hand and start pinching you. So this, I'm just going to show you the team that, that we work with. Look at the fat and the whales here. This is a friend of mine called Michael sitting on the boat. And this is a little, another picture of the apparatus we use in a minute. Um, what species is he? Anybody know the Latin name for that species? <laughs> yeah, you. Now, the Latin name. I said Latin. And no, you guys don't do Latin in school anymore, do you? No, 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 you cheated. I saw. <laughs> She's one of my graduate students, and she cheated. I'm not going to pass her. OK, well, homo sapiens. And this is another alternate gender homo sapiens. This is Carolyn. And you can see here, this is the first poll we used. Um, unlike Doug, they were using a tuna tower with a long bowsprit. We've, we've gone the sort of low-tech route with a long pole. And here we've got a long carbon fiber pole. It's about 20 feet long. And what we're going to do is, um, if this thing ever works, wakes up, show you how we're going to reboot this thing and start all over again. Oh, that's going to mess everything up. Are we there now? All right. Yeah, we're there. Good. All right. So, now, we'll just, yeah, we'll do with the slides in a minute. We, we've got an idea of the whale now. What we're trying to do is to figure out how fat it is. We're going to use sound that is above the hearing range of humans and whales. Joe there was using sounds that are of the order of 200 kilohertz. I'm going to double that for the whales, but in fact, this little unit here is basically the smaller the distance you want to work in, the higher the frequency of sound. And so the sound comes out of this transducer here. As you see, as the transducer gets smaller, the frequency gets, gets higher. And what I want to show you is how we can record the sounds of this transducer. And essentially, all we do is we place this transducer on the back of the, of the whale and do a depth sounder and do a bounce back off the different layers. And in fact, what a whale's got is a a fibrous uh, layer, very shiny white tissue between the blubber and the muscle. And in a right whale, it's about, OK, any office, what's the thickness of the coat of a blubber in a right whale? I want it in inches. Um, yeah, you try. A foot? Um, maybe. Maybe it used to be, but it isn't anymore. They're skinnier than they used to be. Any, I have never seen it as fat as a foot. Yeah, in back there. Uh, yeah? Five inches. I'd take that. That's good. Five to seven inches is what we've been seeing in the field. So um, what we do here, and I'll show you on myself, um, we have to make acoustic contact. We can't have the sound bouncing through the air. So we just use regular ultrasound gel, and here, I've got a transducer that we put, you see that black thing in there? This lands on the back of the whale, and you'll see that in the photographs in just a minute. Long pole, 40 feet tall. That was a 20 feet pole. 20 feet was too short, so long pole. Here, why don't you pass this around? You pass this around the Roman. Take, take a look at it. You pass that over. Just don't stamp on it or drop it, but it's quite robust because you know whales don't tend to be particularly forgiving when you do things to them. So anyway, um, let's just wake this thing up. A friend of mine wrote some software to make this work, and it's quite remarkable. So all we do is get a trace and then tell it to run. Ah, there we go. You can see there, what we've got here, let me explain, is that this is a, a picture of what I'm seeing on the little machine there through my computer. And this is just time along here. And it's basically time of flight for a signal to bounce from the transducer down to a, a structure and back again. And right now, you see there's a little bit of noise here. But essentially, there's nothing there. And the strength, the y-axis here, the more of a peak here is the more of the echo you're getting at any particular spot. So let me see here. If I put my hand, my transducer on here, oh, look, there's a spike right there. Any, any offers what I'm bouncing off there in that spike? 
Any ideas? What's in my hand? Yeah. In the back there on the right. Oh. Okay, how about you? A vein or artery? Uh, possibly, but a vein and an artery really looks much the same as a muscle. You've got to have some sort of discontinuity, some kind of barrier. Yeah. A bone. A bone, exactly. Now, my thumb bone in here is there. Put it on, on my palm there. You see other bones showing up in there. There's one right there. I'll move it across, there's another one. And so essentially, all we do in the field is we take our probe and we wave it around and we um, put it on the back of the animal and we make recordings. And it's quite remarkable, but those recordings are quite consistent. Now, who wants to try this? Yeah, I will try you. Come on out here. This is a, this is a plant I have to make because I know it works on her hand. Go. Cool. Here. Now, you need, need one of these to really clean up. Hold that. Stick it on there. Uh, a nice big pile of goo. Now, is she going to, where, where's the spike on her thumb going to be relative to mine? Any ideas? Smaller. Everybody gets surprised. <laughs> All right. There it is. In fact, there's two spikes there. We get into trouble. Oh, it's just the same size. Well, what can I say? <laughs> All right. You fail. Or I fail. Or something. Well, when we did it in the lab this afternoon, because I checked her out to make sure she was going to be nice and small, it was just perfect. It was half the size of mine. What can you do? It's called field biology. All right. I'm covered in slime now. Okay, so now for extra credit, I'm going to show you something else here. Um, we've got a system here that allows us to play back the, um, <coughs> the information we have. And I'm not going to show you a right well because that stuff's lots of boring stuff, and then suddenly you get a, a peak. But when we had the opportunity to work on a blue whale, that was dead. Um, as you can see there, we got spikes from blue whales. So, so here, what you've got is the same kind of information. This is the blubber coat of the blue whale. And you know, when we were first out in the field with this thing, I was seeing this sort of double, double peak here. And I thought, ah, that's strange, double peak. I went back to the lab and took out some right whale blubber I had. And in fact, if you look at the structure of it, and I've got an overhead here somewhere to sort of show that, um, right whales and blue whales, in fact, all large whales, have, oh, I can't turn this off and things are in the wrong place. Ah, I want it. Oh, that's fine. There we go. We killed it. This is multimedia, polymedia. Um, OK, down here. What you've got here is um, a slice of right whale blubber. There's the skin. There's the muscle here. There's a vessel there. Right here, you've got two, can you smell this? But I'll tell you, it was stinky, this one. My kids, whenever I come home from a dead whale, they say, oh, dad, not again. <laughs> and then they get in the car the next day to go to school, and they apologize to all their friends. I'm sorry, dad's been at a dead whale again. <laughs> but anyway, this here is this double layer. We've got this fibrous sheath with some blood vessels in between it. And here we've got, it's, it's like a sheet of steel. When you're trying to cut through it, it's very, very solid. And it's a wonderful reflecting medium. And we get these double peaks off both of these things here. And there you can see the double peak there on, 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 the, on the echogram that we've got from that. So that pretty much shows you the tool that we've got. And everybody, including myself, said I was absolutely insane to try and do this. But when it comes down to it, the technology is really very easy. It's nothing more than a fancy depth sender and a silly old computer. But to actually achieve it, um, you know, it took us quite a while. It was about three years of sort of messing and <coughs> pulling around in boats to do this. Okay, so this is where we've got to now with regard to how the system works. This is the front of a 25-foot boat, and the engineering shop here cooked up this fancy bowsprit. They built it for a sort of battleship. Who always sort of deals in big ships, not small ones. But I managed to sort of th throw away most of what they made, and what we were left with is this bowsprit here that rotates from the side to side. The whale's over there, we swing it over there, the whale's over there, we swing it over there, and the whale gets back and forth. And the guy driving it gets crazy. But anyway, I stand up on the top and yell at him. <coughs> this here is the long pole we've got. And it slides out through a, through a thing here. There's some video cameras there. So we get a photograph of what's going on. And we can measure the whale's size at the same time. And underneath the deck here, we've got a little box. And if you come up afterwards, you can see the unit I've got there, which is the ultrasound unit, a couple of video cameras, 
computers up on the bridge and lots of wire everywhere and need soldering irons and it's a pain in the neck dealing with electrics and salt water and small boats. But anyway, it works and that's the system. Um, so here we've got the pole, the other end of the pole. It's very hard to get a picture of the whole thing because we're always sort of in the middle of it. But, okay, species. Yeah. It's what? Mm, no. No. Right in the very back. We've seen this one twice already tonight. Yeah, it's a right whale. Good job. Um, and okay, you can tell that it's a baleen whale by its nostrils. Why is that? Toothed whales have got how many holes in their nostrils? Anybody? Toothed whales have got how many? Yeah. Yeah. One. Right. Toothed whales have got one. <laughs> a good chance of getting that one right. <laughs> Toothed whales have got one. Baleen whales have got two holes in the nostrils. Nostrils migrated out the back of the head here so that they didn't get a nose full when they had to breathe and they were sort of charging along in the water. So here we've got a bunch of photographs to show that I can do it. This is another right whale with a probe on the back of the animal. And it's sort of surfacing over. And I think notice that these whales are not, there's not a lot of white water flowing around here. <laughs> if you looked at the way that um, Doug's probing animal <coughs> was trying to get away from the boat, I'm a good 20 feet further away than that tuna tower is. <coughs> I think it makes an enormous difference. This animal here is just sort of poking along and you've got the thing on the side there. So this pole here, I think is going to be important. We haven't done it yet, but we're planning on it. Using it to deploy these suction cup tags and in general, putting things on the back of large whales. I think we've got a very versatile little unit here which will allow us to do a number of different things. And here we are again, just sort of poking along. And This is the best line of approach. If you come in towards the head, they hate it. If you come over the tail, they hate it. But if you come over towards the back, it works pretty well. And that's that. So, we've got time for a video, about two minutes. How are we doing here? Yeah, Tim, roll the video, please. The video is going to be kind of um, murky. It's not a particularly good camera system we had last summer. But here you can see Michael here. This is one of my kids. Some of the nice things about working in whales and boats and stuff, you can take your kids too. This is Oliver. Um, and here's... Here's the bowsprit here, and there's a whale tail. Right whales fluke up quite often. Here's another right whale here, and here's the pole. And you'll see it just, it's a very quick thing, just watch it as it hits. Boom. Oh, not quite there yet. There you go. Done. All you need is half a second, and you get the data, get the data points you need. And you know, it really wasn't too miffed about it. You know, we haven't really picked the, the, the quieter ones. Basically, it works without too much harassment of these guys at all. Okay, did you see the way that whale blew? That was another touch there. We have to do it above the water, otherwise seawater kind of messes things up. But the, the, one of the other things about different large whales is you can tell them by the way their blows look. Anybody know what's characteristic about a right whale blow? Yes. Very good. You probably saw me do that. So anyway, that, that's fine for the video. We know it goes on, but um, you know, it's just more whales. So um, I think that's about it for show and tell as to what we've got here. And if I've got time, any questions? It's V-shaped. Uh, basically, um, humpback whales have fairly low, bushy blows. This is all sort of idealized. But and when it's not blowing hard, if it's blowing hard, everything just sort of flows flat and you don't see it anyway. But blue whales have the tallest spot, then fin whales, and then say whales, and then humpbacks are more bushy, and right whales are V-shaped and bushy. And sperm whales come out the front because their nostrils are off the side there. They're not really up the back, up the back like, like the rest of them are. Okay. Thank you, Michael. at Brandeis University, but now she works at the New England Aquarium, and she's going to give us a sneak preview 
of the sounds in the sea, the sounds cool. from the sea okay. exhibit that the New England Aquarium will premiere on oh. next. Okay. You have to figure out all these instruments, and I can't figure out the microphone here. Okay. I also have to wait for something to warm up. <laughs> there we go. All right, while that's happening, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Um, next April, uh, yeah, next April, uh, if you come down to the New England Aquarium, you'll be able to go into an exhibit that's got a room all of its own, and it's all going to be about underwater sound. Uh, you'll be able to enter as though you're going underwater up in the Arctic near Greenland uh, and you're going to be a humpback whale and you're going to hear what the whale hears as it migrates down uh, down to the Caribbean and you're going to come in closer to the coast than many whales do but that's okay because the coasts have cool sounds so um, you'll hear not the sounds that the humpback whale is making so much, you'll get those, but you'll hear what it's hearing. And then when you, when you finish with that, you'll come into a big room full of, of what we call interactives, which are stations where you can go and try things out and start learning about properties of sound and animals that use sound and the sounds that animals make. And probably, even though you already know almost everything about sound, you'll learn more. Um, and what I'm going to do, I'm just going to be really quick. I'm just going to have, I'm going to give you two sounds. And I want you to tell me which one is an animal and which one isn't. Let's see if I can get them both up at once. One, two. Okay. And here's the first one. This is, this will be number one. So we'll go number one, number two, okay? And extra credit if you tell me what they are. the sound that the walrus is making underwater. He makes that banging sound. They make, they make those bell sounds and I'll, I'll have another walrus in here later but I, I don't want to tell you now. <laughs> but this first one over here, this moment is ice. So it's really up north. Okay, here's, here's set number two. Number one. Number two. Okay, which one do we have? We have a 
tried you for a while. Number two is a lizard. All right. Which animal? Extra credit. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> who haven't? Who haven't we? Uh, uh, there, there, no. You know what it is? <laughs> okay, let's try it. Would you like to take a guess? No. Nope. Okay, I'll tell you. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Nope. <laughs> That's good. I like that. <laughs> okay. Nope. All right, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> this is number two. They live up in the Arctic, and here's another Arctic sound. Your number one was. You start it over again. Two more sets. These are these are tough, huh? Uh, let's see. I'll just do one more set, and then I'll show you that walrus. I promise. Okay. Okay. These are tough. All right. Here's number one. Kind of soft. I hope you heard it okay. Here's number two. Okay, which one's the animal? Here's it. The... Way back there with the with the bag. Right there. Oh. Two animals. Good. All right. Any guesses as to what it is. <laughs> yes. I know, but these are these are kind of soft. Let me here's um get this back up. Alright. Here's number two. Yeah, yeah, but some, some, I'll tell you what, I'll give you the whole story. <laughs> you have another? Underwater, underwater horse and wagon. <laughs> nope, number one was rain heard from underwater, and number two were snapping shrimp, and snapping shrimp are really loud and noisy down in Georgia where Michael goes to study these right whales. And let, let me just show you that, let me just, I'll play that walrus, the other walrus I sound, I promise. You can, you can hear the other kind of sounds that walruses make. So they make that knock too. Okay. Now, I put you through all this so that you know that it's not just whales that are down there making noise. And there's a lot of sound down there, and it all means something to some kind of animals in the water. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's a walrus. <laughs> Good try, though. All right. I hope you'll come and see the exhibit when it's open. This will be next April. Thank you each of the